Good evening. Good evening. I want to thank you for joining us for this evening for a legacy of a, mo of a movement celebrating Medgar and Merle Evers. Can we give them a round of applause on tonight? Tonight's event is the result of a collaboration between Seaver College, Student Affairs, and the Office of the Provost. So we want to thank them for this wonderful and historical and legendary event. I am Dr. Stanley Talbert, and I'm an assistant professor of religion here at Seaver College. Good to see some of my students. We are especially privileged to have with us this evening Merle Evers, Jerry Mitchell, and Jamie Floyd. Let's give them a round of applause. We are pleased that each of you are here with us, and we are joined by students tonight, faculty, staff, and many guests from the community. I want to thank each of you for joining us this, evening's, uh, this evening for this lecture, and we are very blessed by your presence. We have some VIPs in the room. I'd like to introduce you to a few of them. From our Pepperdine community, we have Jay Gooseby-Smith, Vice President for Community Belonging and Chief Diversity Officer. We have Tim Perrin, Senior Vice President of Strategic Implementation. <laughs> Chancellor Sarah Jackson and her husband, Sam. <laughs> as well as Provost Jay Brewster and his wife, Stephanie. From the larger community, we are joined by family and friends of Merle Evers. Rena Evers Everett, daughter of Medgar and Merle Evers. <laughs> Dean Bakwe, longtime editor for the New York Times. <laughs> Michael Roden litigator, trial attorney, and screenwriter. <laughs> and Todd Robinson, writer and director. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Let me also provide a few words about our format for this evening. Following tonight's conversation, we'll take a brief two to three minute recess to excuse students who have an evening class beginning at 6 p.m. Students, if you do not have an evening class, please extend our speaker and the other guests the courtesy of remaining in your seats through the question and answer session. Following the recess, we will proceed immediately to the Q&A. We have a mic at the center front of the auditorium. If you have a question, please proceed there. Please introduce yourself before you begin your question. I'd now like to ask Dr. Tara Hall, Associate Dean of Student Affairs for Diversity and Belonging, uh, to come at this time. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. As we prepare for what we know will be an engaging conversation tonight on the eve of Mrs. Evers' 90th birthday. Yes. Yes. We have some greetings and celebratory remarks from some who were not able to physically be with us today. Let's all please turn our attention to a video with some special greetings. Hello, birthday girl. <laughs> this is your congressman in Mississippi, Benny Thompson. I really wish I could be there in person uh, to see all of the ce celebration that's going on there at Pepperdine. But you know, uh, I had you long before Pepperdine. So I appreciate and applaud all the work that you've done, uh, not just in my home state of Mississippi, but all over the country. Your work on behalf 
of doing the right thing with the NAACP, with women groups, and just being who you are. You and I had the good fortune recently uh, to sit side by side at the Image Awards in Los Angeles. And we shared a lot of conversation during that time. But nonetheless, uh, to you and your family, I want to wish you a happy birthday. Uh, as you know, there are a lot of things we have underway here in Mississippi, uh, given uh, Mega and, and your legacy here in our state. So to our birthday girl, happy birthday. May you have many, many more. And I know based on uh, the number of people who I've heard who are involved in it, it has to be a joyous occasion. So as your Mississippi Congressman, uh, I wanna wish you happy 90th birthday, and I look forward to many more. Thank you much. Hello everybody, this is Congressman Maxwell Alejandro Frost, proudly representing Florida's 10th Congressional District, and I just wanted to wish a special happy birthday to Merle Evers-Williams, a civil rights champion, voting rights champion, and champion for equity for everybody in this country. I wouldn't be in this position without people like Ms. Ever-Williams who have been doing the amazing work her entire lifetime. And so, uh, Ms. Ever-Williams, thank you so much. Thank you for inspiring me. Thank you for lifting up not just the black community, but humanity in this world and pushing us to do better. You know, I think about Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And you've lived that out your whole life, not some things, but all things. So it's an honor to be here virtually. I hope to meet in the future. God bless and have a great day. Happy birthday. Happy 90th birthday, Merle Evers. It's Malcolm Lee, filmmaker we met years ago when I was trying to mount a movie with Jerry Mitchell and Michael Roden about Emmett Till and um, your husband's contribution to the movement. Um, and I want to say and reach out and wish you all the best on this 90th birthday, which I'm, I'm not so sure, based on how you look, that you're 90 years old. You're the best looking 90 year old I've ever seen. Good black don't crack, we all know that. Uh, wanted to wish you happy birthday, say how important you are to this country, to this country's history, to the movement, and to me personally. Uh, it was a joy to meet you and an honor, and I'm so glad that uh, I got to shake your hand and look you in the eyes and hear your words. So enjoy your evening, enjoy your day, enjoy your week, enjoy your year of turning 90. As my dad would say, you're in your 91st year and you're doing it so well. So take good care, all the best. Happy birthday, Merle. For so long, your grace, your courage, and your abiding commitment to American possibilities has inspired the entire nation. More than 70 years ago, you and Medgar began the work that has become your legacy, defining a vision for the nation we could become. So as you look out over the crowd of students in front of you, I hope that in their eager and determined faces, you see your work has inspired an entire generation, actually generation after generation, to continue fighting for a brighter future. Thank you for answering hate with love, for choosing leadership in the face of great hostility, and for never giving up on the promise of America. You are a light that guides us all as we meet the challenges of our time. We send you our love and our gratitude and may God bless you and your incredible family. Wow, wow. I'd like to recognize, as Dr. Talbert has done, other special guests joining us today, Rob Reiner and his wife, Michelle Singer. Yay. Rob Reiner is an actor and director whose portfolio spans numerous television shows and movies. One of his directorial projects is the 1996 film, Ghost of Mississippi, which is based on the 1994 trial of Byron De La Beckwith, 
convicted murderer of Medgar Evers and is central to today's discussion. So it is very fitting that he is able to be with us today. I introduce and welcome Rob Reiner to our Pepperdine community. I've never followed a president before, so that's a little tough. I'm looking at the, uh, the, the Benny Thompson. Uh, we made the movie in 1996, so that's what, 27 years ago. And uh, neither Benny nor I had a gray beard at that time <laughs> and when I met with him. But um, made a movie that was mentioned, uh, Ghost of Mississippi. And up until that point, and this was 1994, there had never been a white man convicted of killing a black man in the state of Mississippi. That had not happened. And because of Merle Evers and Jerry Mitchell, who you're going to hear from, they played a huge role in making that happen. Byron de Beckwith stood trial twice before, and was hung, there were hung juries. On the third time, he was convicted, and that was the first time. And it opened the door, and Jerry Mitchell, who's done some great reporting at the time for the uh, Clarion Ledger, and Merle's, who was uh, uh, a consultant on the film and helped me all the way through making the film, and I want to share one little story about it because it was a very emotional uh, experience for me. Uh, I went to the, uh, the house that Merle and Medgar and her children lived, and Rena's here. She was a little baby at the time. And I stood on that driveway on Gine Street, and I started to cry. I started to cry because the idea that a father, and I had two children at the time, I have three now, that a father could be taken away from his children in front of them in their house, it was just devastating. And, and Merle did something that, and I'll never forget it, uh, it sits in my office, the most prominent thing I have in my office. When we were promoting the film, we went on the Oprah Winfrey show, and Merle gave me, uh, I I encased in this, uh, in this uh, frame, was uh, a poll tax receipt that was in Medgar's wallet the night he was assassinated. And it still had blood stains on it. And she gave that to me, and I went again. I went again. I started to cry. So it's a very important uh, time for me, and I'm very proud to have been able to do this. And uh, the work that Jerry and Merle have done opened the door for many more prosecutions, and many more uh, people were brought to justice for the horror. Rena was, uh, you know, she said to me, um, because uh, Rena played a part. All the kids were in it, you know. They all played their parts. But Rena said, no, I want to be in the jury box. <laughs> when they convict him, I want to be there. So Rena was there in the jury box. Anyway, uh, thank you. And I, I'm such a, um, I'm, I'm, I'm so thrilled. And uh, what a pleasure to do this. And uh, we have a great, great journalist here, Jamie Floyd. You've have you met her? Do you know Jamie? She, she actually interviewed Merle before, and she told me right before we uh, started, uh, started this that she's writing a book on, on Thurgood Marshall, which, uh, you know, famous uh, uh, case in, uh, you know, Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, which started, you know, was a big, bit, not didn't start, but it was a big push for the civil rights movement. So she's a brilliant, uh, journalist and interviewer, and she is going to interview these two people, and uh, I'm glad you're all here, and I can't wait to hear what they have to say. Thank you. Is it on? Is it on? Can you hear me? Wow. I, I'm already emotionally spent. 
Uh, I do want to say thank you to Pepperdine already, Seabird College, Student Affairs, Chancellor, Provost, all those things. Hello again. It's been so long. Hello again to you too, but I was looking at you. It's been so long. We'll catch up. Um, all right, look, my role here is really small. I'm just here to help these two have a conversation. They don't need me. They have a conversation all the time. Uh, but, you know, I'm going gonna, uh, I'm gonna to ask you to indulge me for a moment, and, and I want to give a little context. Um, I met Jerry, I want to say 30 years ago at an IRE conference, IRE Investigative Reporters and Editors, um, and I followed his career tick by tick, uh, including this case that he helped to crack, his collaboration, his friendship, with Merle Evers Williams, who was my hero because I grew up in a family of civil rights activists, so I'd always heard the name, Merle Evers Williams. Merle Evers, as a child, Medgar Evers. Medgar Evers, Merle Evers, the Evers. So I was following the case and following Jerry and following Merle and following their work. I never dreamed I would sit in the presence of this woman. And I want to say to you that it is a gift. I didn't write this down. I'm just speaking now, which is dangerous. <laughs> but it is a gift to be in the presence of the power and grace of Merle Evers Williams. And I, I say this from the bottom of my heart. I've met her in 94 when the case was happening, in 96 for the movie. Twice she has graced me with her presence. And I've said all through my 30-year career, you can check my bios, I've done hundreds of interviews, that the one that has meant the most to me is my time spent with this one. Merle Evers Williams. I meant it, and here I am again. <laughs> and when we stepped into the room with Jerry, my dear friend, and this dear woman, I felt that power again. She just speaks, and you're about to hear it, and it just blows you away. So let's hear her speak. How about that? <laughs> Enough talking about her. Let's hear from her. All right, so the two of you, the two of you have known each other for so long. And many people in this room know about your long friendship and collaboration, but they may not know how you met, right? They may not know the story of how the two of you came to collaborate, how you met, how the work began on the case. Who wants to tell it? <laughs> Merle, you want to start us off? Take us back. Take us back, if you will. You know, one of the, thank you very much, thank you. And I thank this wonderful audience. But one of the most difficult things that I have to do is to go back. Because it's so painful. But even after all of these years, I find myself going back periodically not necessarily on the date that uh, Madgar was assassinated, but as things happen in our country that remind me of those times then. And I say, still? Are we still dealing with the same angers, the same hate? What has happened to us as a people? What has happened to us as a country? Can't we ever rid ourselves of those evils? And sometimes the answer comes back in sweeping form and says, no, it's here permanently. And I say to that voice, you're wrong. It will not last permanently in this country because there are too many people of goodwill too many young people who are coming up, learning about our society, the good, the bad, and all the in-between. 
And as I listen and work with those young people, there is hope that America will not have to deal with prejudice and racism as it has in the past, that they will help bring us through to be who we should be. That is my hope. That is my prayer. And it is something that each of us must do, that is reach out to our young people, let them know about the past, but let them know that they are of the now and of the future, and they can change those things into a better America, into a better world. I see little faces who are astonished at the sum of the things that I share about happen, what happened, as they say, in your time. <laughs> but are we going to have to deal with it too? More than likely, yes, you will. But you will be better equipped because you have better books. Perhaps you have better teachers, but you have a better sense of who you are and what you can do and who are the other people your playmates, who they are and what they can do. And you will build a better future for yourselves and for America. I feel that deep within my heart. If I didn't, I throw up my hands and I don't know where I would walk. Nor do I know where I would jump off into a river of hopelessness. But I believe in the future. I believe in the young people that are out there learning and who want to help. I believe in those who are not as young, who have lived long enough to know the history of this country. And where and how we can move forward I refuse to believe that this nation of my birth cannot lift itself up out of the muck and the mire that it has had around its ankles for all of these years. That we're stronger than that. We can come together and do better. There are people who say in other countries, look at America. They are so this, they are so that. It's so fine. Those of us who reside here know better than that. But we know what we have in hand, and we do know what we can do. It's a matter of doing it. It's a matter of each one of us here and abroad and everywhere else being committed to seeing that we eradicate injustice, that we get rid of, of hatred, that we be able to embrace people for who they are the inner person, your thoughts, your deeds, and the strength, and I'll use a word to eradicate those. You can take that any way you want to. Out of the system of this democracy. My husband, the father of my children, who served in World War II, who believed in America and fought for America, and when asked why he was giving his life for making things better here, he said, because this is my country, and I believe in my country, and I will do whatever is necessary to make my country better than what it is today. 
and it will happen. I followed along behind him, and I asked the question, yeah, I do too. But when? When will that happen? When will people who are truly committed to freedom, to justice, to equality, come together and say, yes, we will. We will make America the kind of country that she says she is, the kind of country that we know she can be. So I ask all of you, are you willing to sacrifice just a little bit? Just a wee bit? Work together, <laughs> even though you may not like each other. <laughs> try talking, try finding a way to get in there. You'll be surprised how good it feels once you're there and how blessed we all will be if we each participate in our own ways to make America great. You know, and I know, that it is possible. You know and I know, it takes working together. And my question to you, are you ready? Because we surely are not there today. Are you ready to give something of yourself with others in your community, in your schools, in your institutions of higher learning, in the streets? In the holes? And I said I wouldn't use this word, but I am. My daughter's eyebrows are going up. <laughs> but in the shitholes of America, are you willing to step into that and know that on the outside that there is a hose that you can wash that off and keep going and going strong? I'm going to stop because I'm not here to preach. <laughs> but I will close by saying, <laughs> no, I'm not going on for another 20 minutes. We owe it to ourselves. We owe it to our children. The next generation is coming along. Not to ignore what is standing directly in our faces. Grab it. Hold on it. And say, I am not through with you yet. So guess what's coming? And it will be the best of each and every one of us. I know we can do it. I'm reaching my 90th birthday. That's okay, you can applaud. I'm still a little on the tired side. And when I really want to talk to myself, I say, merely may. You can do it. And something says, you really think I can? <laughs> Ministers in the house, forgive me. But I answer, hell yes, <laughs> you can. <laughs> and you will. And it's that kind of attitude 
that will move us forward in today and the days yet to come. And I know I am really going to catch it from my daughter <laughs> for using that term, but I felt it was necessary because I feel so strongly about all of this. And I wish to thank each and every one of you for all that you do for yourselves, your neighborhoods, your state, your country, because we are badly in need of working together to make this a safe and secure country. I thank you. Keep, keep it, keep it, because you're, you're, not, you're not finished. You got one. You're good. Keep it. Uh, I'm going to ask, do you mind? Oh, hold on to it, because I have a follow-up. I have a follow-up. Hang on. Hang on, Marilla, you're not done. this question. The young people will then say, I feel despair. I'm losing hope. I hear what you say about optimism and hope. But Ms. Murley Evers Williams, how do I keep hope alive? You do something that's a little difficult to do, but it is durable. You dismiss defeat from your mind, your heart, your vocabulary. Instead, you say, yes, I can. Yes, I will. Watch me. That challenge to oneself and finding others who feel very much the same way of working with elders who have been there, who know the battleground, Nothing like it. It's not my generation's responsibility. It's not your generation's responsibility. It's not the younger people's responsibility. It's all of our responsibilities to find a way that we can work together. And there's no such thing as we can't. And that's what too many of us think. Get out there and do it. Even if you fall the first time. Get up and try again. Don't ever give up on your freedom. Don't ever give up on who you are. What you want to be. I did not intend to be a preacher tonight. But I will say this, and it's my belief. There is someone who is higher than each one of us in this room. When I can't solve a problem, sometimes I think I'm so smart only to find out I'm dumb. But I cry out, God, help me. Simple. In his time, and it's usually not too long, he does. And I say, oops, what happened? Acknowledge what's happened and keep going on. Don't ever give up on your dreams. Don't ever give up on your family. Don't ever give up on your community, your state, your nation, because you are a part of it. You are a part of it. I've talked enough.
we'll be back to you. <laughs> Mr. Mitchell. Yes. Do you share this, is it fair to call it optimism? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think in general, yeah. I mean, I, I'm optimistic in a sense, but I'm also mindful of this, and, and I know Merle Evers has talked about this as well in our conversations, is it w the, one of the problems we're having right now is that we keep repeat repeating our history because we don't know our history. And that's what I see over and over again, that people don't have a concept or knowledge of what has happened before. The civil rights movement, for example, gets reduced to Rosa Parks sat down, Dr. King stood up, that I, everybody got their rights. Well, that's such a lie, you know, and in and, 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 and so many ways. Um, and so we need to tell these stories. There are now people out there who say, oh, let's not tell things that are uncomfortable. Let's not share things that are painful in history, right? And we are at a Bible college, so I can say this, right? Does the Bible have any tragic stories in it? <laughs> Maybe a few, but you guys keep studying it, right? Why? So you can learn from it. That's what history is about, to learn from it. So we don't do the same thing over and over and over again, and that's what we seem to be doing right now. Um, anyway, it, it's, it, it kind of blows my mind. But that's why I think it's so important that people know these things, to not rely on your news uh, from Facebook or social media completely. I mean, it's okay to go on social media. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is you never know that what's on social media is not some bot from some, you know, <laughs> Either, either special interest group or foreign interest group that's, that's putting it out there. You know, they're talking about pizza parlors and child molestation and all sorts of things like that that are just not, they're just lies. And so you have to, that's why I think journalism has such a role in this. And you cannot have justice until you have the truth. And even, yeah, it's worth clapping about. And even if you can't get justice or maybe complete justice, you can still have truth. Mm -hmm. You can still tell the truth about what's going on. And that's why uh, I love you, Marley. And you, you've always been a beacon of light to tell the truth, regardless of, you know, uh, you know, the consequences even of, of what, you, what you had to say. So uh, I applaud you, and I'm just so grateful to be with you and to help you celebrate your 90th birthday. This is a special day, and so love you and love Rena, love your whole family to that. So great to be with you. Thank you. When you, uh, Jerry Mitchell, were, I think, about 25 years old and stumbled into your first, I call, I call Jerry a civil rights journalist. There are a few, there are a few. Uh, not enough, but that's what you've been doing for, for 30 years, 35 years. When you stumbled into that first case, could you imagine the course of your life no. meeting Merle Evers, no. Rita Bender, and uh, oh no, it, uh, it totally changed my life. Yeah, so so say a bit about uh, the. It's it's very interesting, the the, the trajectory of your life. Yeah. Uh, I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a, I'm a white Southern boy. Him. I mean, yeah. wasp is waspish as they go. So I mean, <laughs> you can pretty much imagine my background. Um, yeah, I. I, I, mean, I had two events happen. One is I saw a movie, and I don't even recommend the movie per se. I mean, it, it's a good movie. It's not. It's a well-made movie, but it's a fictional film. So, I, I mean, in terms of if you're looking for truth, I guess, of uh, Mississippi Burning, 
And I happened to see it with two FBI agents who investigated that case, as well as the journalist who covered the case. And after it was over with, I'm just, my mouth is wide open because these 20 Klansmen have gotten away with a triple murder of these young men and never been prosecuted for murder. And I'm like, I'm a court reporter at this point. I'm going, how did that happen? You know, they never prosecuted him for murder? And so, okay, that was event number one. Event number two happened when, I don't know if you're like me, I'm asking mainly the students here, if someone tells you you can't have something, I want it like a million times worse. Anybody else like that? Yeah, I got a few takers on that. Um, and so there was something in Mississippi called the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission, which was this segregationist spy agency, Merle knows all about, spied on her husband and them, and um, trying to catch them in an illegal act. We were right about that. So anyway, so the Mississippi legislature, this agency existed from the 1950s to 1970s, kind of the state equivalent of the White Citizens Council. And then the state did away with it. And the, and the Mississippi legislature voted to seal all those spy records for 50 years. So my first thought when I found that out was, there's something in there, right? Or they wouldn't be sealing for 50 years. So lo and behold, began to have sources leak me the files. And what they show was at the same time the state of Mississippi was prosecuting Byron D. LeBeckwith for the murder of Beggar Evers. This other arm of the state, the Sovereignty Commission, which was headed by the governor, was secretly assisting the defense trying to get Beckwith acquitted, and nobody knew that. And so that story ran October 1st of 89, and I called Merle Evers. <laughs> and that's kind of what began the whole thing is her family and her courage said, my, she said, my husband's case needs to be reopened. Mm -hmm. And because she pushed for justice and kept pushing for justice and didn't give up, justice finally happened. And Byron D. LeBeckwith, so let me tell the, I'll tell the one Beckwith story. You know, anyway, I want to get you a full flavor of Beckwith. And, and by the way, if you haven't seen the movie Ghost of Mississippi, you get a very good glimpse of Byron Dela Beckwith in that film. But I do want to share the encounter I had with him. I went to interview him. He lived in uh, Signal Mountain, Tennessee, which is just outside of Chattanooga. Spent about six hours talking. Absolutely the most racist person I ever spent serious time with. N-word this, N-word that. Started on all the other non-white races, also very anti-Semitic. In fact, he was more anti-Semitic probably than anything else. And anyway, you know how sometimes you talk to someone for a while and feel like afterward maybe you need a bath or something? <laughs> you know, that's what it felt like. So got done talking, and by this time it was dark, and he insisted on like walking me out to my car, and I'm like, that's okay. <laughs> I think I can find my way. So he walks me out to the car, gets me out and says, if you write positive things about white Caucasian Christians, God will bless you. If you write negative things about white Caucasian Christians, God will punish you. If God does not punish you directly, several individuals will do it for him. And so his wife had made me a sandwich. <laughs> I think you can guess what I did with a sandwich after that. So, fast forward, Byron D. LeBeckwith gets indicted for the murder of Mega Rivers. Uh, he fights sex tradition. At the time I interviewed him, this is all pre-internet, remember, he had no idea that I was the one that wrote the story that got the case reopened. <laughs> By now, he figured it out. And so he's in the courtroom, he spots me, and he goes, you see that boy over there? When he dies, he's going to Africa. <laughs> I turned him. I turned to a friend of mine and went, you know, I've always wanted to go to Africa. <laughs> so Byron D. LeBeckwith was convicted of the murder of Meg Revers in the exact same courtroom, by the way. He'd been tried in almost 30 years to the day. And when the word guilty rang out, you could hear the waves of joy mm -hmm. as they cascaded down the hall until it reached a foyer full of people, black and white, just erupted in cheers. And I just felt chills 
because the impossible had suddenly become possible. This woman prayed for justice against impossible odds. There was no murder weapon, no transcript, no evidence left, and one by one, all these things showed up. The, the crime scene photographs of the killing of Meg Rivers, including the fingerprint of Byron D. LeBeck was lifted from the murder weapon. She saved a copy of the court transcript in her safety deposit box. And the prosecutor in the case, who we need to mention, he deserves a tremendous credit, Bobby DeLauder, found the murder weapon in his father-in-law's closet, which sounds like I'm making it up, but, but it all really happened. All because this woman never gave up.